1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read the first nine verses of that book. So again, that's 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, down to verse 9. Thank you very much. It reads this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And that'll conclude our reading this morning. That's reading First Peter chapter one, verses one through nine. And if I made some mistakes in the reading, I apologize this morning for doing so. Um, but we're going to take a title this morning that is derived from verse three of our scripture reading today. Verse 3 reads this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The title of our message today will be The Christian's Great Hope. The Christian's Great Hope. Now we have a, a few purposes this morning in our message today that I feel inclined to share with you what our intent is, um, or what we're trying to accomplish in bringing this message forth. The first one is that it might provoke in you praise to God. That by more clearly seeing what God has done, that it will compel you and I both to worship Him with more intensity and all, that we would lift His name up uh, even more than what we do. The second one, Peter the writer here uh, alludes to towards the end of the reading that we did, and that is for those of you who are experiencing trial, that you would endure those trials and that you would find hope amidst the trial. So those are our two purposes this morning, and we're going to do something perhaps a little different than normal. I wish I would do this more often. I may try to do that as I feel inclined, but I want to break down these verses for you. I want to walk down, line by line, verse by verse, what Peter is saying. Um, because, and I'll step outside for just a moment, the framework of our message this morning and make this comment. If you're someone who study, uh, struggles to study the scriptures, and say read the scriptures, but study the scriptures. If you're someone who, in the midst of reading their Bible is always hesitant to identify concrete meaning in the Scriptures. Or in other words, come to a conclusion. Very often today, there is a Christian culture which includes the idea of small groups. And in those small groups, often people will go to each other's houses and they'll meet sometime throughout the week and they'll take a Bible verse and they'll read it. And then they make this terrible comment to start, and that is, what does this mean to you? It doesn't really matter what it means to me and you. 
It matters what it means when God said it. Now, there is some truth in that request or in that comment, and that is, would be better situated, how does this apply to you? But those are radically different things. Because when you ask that second question, how does this apply to you? Implied within that comment is that you already know the meaning of it. And you're just looking for how your life circumstance is instructed or inspired by the concrete meaning that God desired. That's very different than me saying, well, to me, this verse means, and I come up with one meaning, and then you read the text, and you come up with a different meaning, and we both smile, and we say, well, I'm so happy that helps you. That's not the way the Bible is is meant to be understood. Peter himself later on writes, that the scriptures of are, are of, of no private interpretation. I don't get to interpret it the way I want it to be interpreted. But the beautiful thing about it is that if we just interpret it the way God intends it, it has the greatest meaning it could possibly have to all of us. I don't need to twist the meaning to make myself feel good. I need to understand the original meaning so that it will do what God intended to do in me and to me and for me. And so this morning, I want you to know that when you read the scriptures, if you're a young person or perhaps you're an older person, you're saying, you know, where do you start and how do you come to meaning and all these big words as someone who has preached for 17 years, let me tell you what I do. I look at the verse. I did that this week with this text. I read the first nine verses, and I said to myself, when I got done reading those nine verses, what does that mean? It's not like that there is some magic, because I got called to preach, I suddenly just understand it. I'm where you're at. I'm looking at these big words, and we often use the King James Version of the Bible, and some of the words and language and the syntax, which just means the structure of the sentences, is old. We don't write like that today. And so what do I do? I get a dictionary out and I get a little piece of paper out and I write down a phrase like, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask myself the question, what does that mean? So if we start with verse three, because verses 1 and 2 are the introduction, and there's a, there's a number of things we could get bogged down in verse 1 and 2. Know this, Peter is writing to a group of Christians scattered abroad what would be modern-day Turkey. So he's writing to a, not just one group. So if you go to Paul and Corinthians, he's writing to a specific church and addressing specific things. Peter here is writing what we would call a circular letter, one that is spread around. It's meant to be passed from church to church. It's meant to be written down again and then copies made of it. And it's meant for Christians in general to derive help and understanding about God and his truth through this letter. And so he addresses that in verses 1 and 2, and I'm not going to go more into that. But when we get into verse 3, he says something in our language that would be a little odd. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. We often, when we come into the house of the Lord, we thank God for his blessings. And we acknowledge that God blesses us. But this has it turned to the opposite. Here, the person is blessing God. How do you do that? How do you and I bless God? There's nothing that he needs that I have. And so that's, in our way of worship today, that seems a little odd of a statement. So as a, someone who doesn't understand this, I say, okay, what does that mean? Why would he do that? Why would Peter bless God? So I began to think like this, okay? How can someone who is inferior bless someone who is superior? So think in your own life. Perhaps the most natural conception of this would be parents and children. There is nothing my children have. It was actually funny. uh, One of my boys, you'll probably be able to tell who. One of my boys, we were walking up the stairs yesterday or a couple days ago and, and said something like, 
this was mine, I own it, it's not yours, Dad. And I was like, whoa, 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 buddy. You know, and he was being, he was joking about it. And I said, everything you see right here is mine. <laughs> and he's like, everything, even you. You're mine. I own you right now, all right? And uh, we got a good laugh out of that. But in essence, there's a lot of truth in that. He, he doesn't own anything. Everything he has is mine. Or everything that he has made a steward of, I gave to him. And there's nothing he has that I couldn't go buy a hundred of if I didn't want them. So then, how can my son bless me? Well, a lot. Imagine for a moment, one of my kids this week has been in the particularly affectionate mood. And so, randomly, unprovoked, he'll run over to me, give me a big hug, and say, Dad, I'm so glad you're my dad. He's blessing me. He's extolling, praising Lifting up. Now listen, that's how we bless God. We cannot endow him with anything he doesn't have. But of our own free will, we can exclaim his name unprovoked by him. Not because we just received a a bonus at work. Not just because there was some circumstance in life that fell out to our benefit. But it's just, I am so grateful that he is my God, that I am his, that I am secure in him. And so in the Greek, there's even this exclamation that goes in that Peter is saying, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our language, we would have an exclamation point there. What that causes me to do when you read is you pause. When somebody puts an exclamation point, you pause and you notice that there is unusual excitement. And then Peter continues from there and he begins to tell us why he is blessing God. Now, I'll have you note, he he could have said, blessed be God, but he didn't. He said, blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is really important because He's writing this, and among some of these churches are Jewish people. And in some of these congregations are Jewish people who don't look at Jesus as the Messiah. So Peter here is making no bones about. He's not just thanking some energy in the universe. He's not just worshiping the God of the Jews. He's saying the God of Jesus Christ. Acknowledging the specific who he is. Jesus Christ God or the father of Jesus Christ who he's worshiping, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Now, especially if you've been here on Wednesday nights, begotten us again should sound familiar. And if you haven't, you probably recognize that phrase. It means the same thing as John 3, being born again. So he says, who by your abundant mercy has caused us to be born, or in the Greek it is born from above, a God birth. And John 3 gives us a lot more extensive information about that. So one thing that he is thanking God for, he's blessing God for, is that I am born again. Now, pause for just a half a moment and say, if you've been saved by God's grace, you ought to thank him for that every day. And the reason is because you and I, presently, the blessings of having been born again are veiled. We don't fully understand them. Once we do, I think that's why heaven is going to be one continuous worship service. Is because we'll have more understanding and we will be reaping the benefits of what took place on that moment for all of eternity in contrast to what we could be experiencing in hell, but also in contrast to what we experience down here. Again, I've said before, the Christian who is terrified to die does not have a proper conception of what is to come and of what this world has to offer. You're too much clinging to this stuff. Even the most valued, treasured things, the relationships, the people, are but 
rubbish in comparison to what awaits. Here, he's begotten us again unto a lively hope. What does that mean? So, again, as a sidetrack to keep up with some of our young Christians here, I look it up. Lively hope. We don't say that much. The word lively to us, if I say I have a lively child, you think exuberant or energetic. That's not what it means here. The word lively in this text means ever living, never dying. So we have a hope. Again, what does that mean? This expectation yet to be realized. There's a certainty about it. We know it's there. And we hope towards it. And that, whatever it is that we're hoping towards or expecting, is ever living, never dying. Let me say this for a moment. There are many blessings that happen at the moment of of being born again. There are so many. There's no way this morning we we could even get close to enumerating them all. But here, Peter hits on one that I think is oftentimes neglected. And that is the moment that you are saved. Not only has God rescued you from the bondage of sin, not only has he reserved a place in heaven for you, not only has he forgiven you, there's so many benefits, but he also provides for you a hope of what is to come. Now the implications of that are far-reaching. Because listen, there are many people today, there are usually, well, three categories of people. That's one of them, you and I, and I'll get back to that in a moment. There's another group. That other group are people who have to create artificial hope that expires in this life. So you and I do it all the time, right? We set these goals. I want to get to this point in life. I want to accomplish this by this date. And so, in the moment as we're looking forward to it, we're hoping towards it. And we're working towards it to be realized. And we inch closer and closer, and sometimes we reach it, and sometimes we don't. But notice here, this adjective that he uses does not apply to that situation because our hopes that we create are not ever living. They're temporary. And so, do you remember the man that Jesus used in Luke chapter 12? And as he was... Uh, uh, he had noticed all of his goods and all of his, his treasures. And he says, you know what? It exceeds what my barns will hold. And so let me tear down my barns and build bigger ones so I can store them. And then I will perpetually enjoy them for the remainder of my life. And God said to him, you fool. This night, thy soul shall be required of thee. And what is it now? He didn't say this exactly, but what is it now that you have put all your hope in? You see, one facet of hope is a facet of hope that expires. And as a Christian, this is a really tough balancing act. Because what we find is that essential to life moving forward is planning and setting goals, seeking to accomplish those goals. And yet, in the construction of those things, it is important It is necessary that while we're constructing it, we're doing it as a temporary measure. So think of someone, the difference in building a house and a tent, right? When you build a tent, you've got to calculate what if it does rain. You've got to make calculations. Where's the best place to put this? But you're going to be less contemplative. You're going to be less thoughtful about how that you do that versus when you're building a permanent residence. Now, the sad and ironic thing about today is that very often as Christians, we can slip into being very meticulous in our building of hopes for this world and rather flippant about building our hopes for the next one. And that's completely backwards, right? If your mind is always conceiving about things that are not an ever-living hope and you're neglecting those things, those treasures laid up in heaven which are eternal, you've made an erroneous calculation here and you need to back up. And the way that I gauge that for myself is where is my mind's attention always going? 
Like take a day, any day you want to. And at the end of that day, randomly, have yourself write down all the time you spent on things that will not matter when you die. And then all the time you spent thinking on those things that will matter when you die. And if you're like me, very often it's 18 hours, 16 hours, 15 hours, 9 minutes. And it's a gauge for me. Am I exhausting myself in building a hope? It doesn't matter. He says we have an ever-living hope. That's the first group of people. Here's the second group of people. People who are wise enough to recognize the futility in life. That concept derives from Ecclesiastes, right? When Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, backed up and he considered life, he saw it's all vanity. It's all empty. That's what the word vanity means. What does it matter? Because a thousand years from now, the world is still around. Everything you do won't matter. The house you built, the business that you are a part of, even the, 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 the government that you vote for and invest in and keep track of. Likely a thousand years from now, if time goes on, none of it will be here. And so it, it draws some people not to saying, well, let's build an artificial hope, but they go to, there's no hope. It's a very depressing thing. It's why a lot of suicide in young people has skyrocketed recently in the last decade. Is because they're perceiving, well, if I put my hand on all this and in the end I die, what does it matter? It's no different than what those in Isaiah 22 when there was a... a an army that was going to come and try to destroy the city. And they're on the outskirts and they know, or this group of people within the city are saying, okay, we know that tomorrow they're going to attack, that they're stronger than what we are, so we have 12 hours to live. What should we do? And that's where the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, comes from. What will it matter anyway? And Paul quotes that in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, if Jesus did not conquer death... What does life matter anyway? You might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. You're annihilated. You're gone. And so if you don't find hope in the eternal ever-living hope, no, you're finding it in one of two places. You're finding no hope whatsoever, which means you're going to live a life where just do what makes yourself feel pleasurable in the moment. Or you're going to build something temporary over and over and over, and I contend that people who are saved by God's grace in the process or in the end, when they have constructed that hope that they have built on temporary foundation, in the end it will lead you to depression. Because what you'll look back on, you're saying, you mean I spent all of this time on this? And now it's eroding. Peter, he tells us, one thing we have been saved to is hope. An ever-living, constant hope because, he says, by the, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to continue to move on here in verse 4. So the first thing, we've been born again to a lively hope. Here's what else we've been born again to. An inheritance. So the concept of being born and an inheritance, don't they go together? Absolutely. If you're born, you've probably thought yourself, there's been a person, you know, a, a really famous, wealthy person who had a child, and most of us think to ourselves, man, they got no idea what they were just born into. And they won't know. For a long time, as a child, they're naive to all the things they're enjoying. They have this huge inheritance, these huge privileges that are presently they're unaware of. Here he tells us, you were born again, and at the moment of our conversion, that same truth applies. The moment that a person is saved, they have no idea what awaits. You don't have an idea throughout the rest of your life, but hopefully you get more of an idea as your Christian life matures. You begin to understand more things than what you've understood. And if you're like me, I just think, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but if the conception of what the Bible has projected before me is accurate, it is going to be unutterably wonderful. And he uses these words to describe our inheritance, and this description is meant 
to be compared to what a normal inheritance is. He says about our inheritance in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible. What does that mean? Incorruptible. It cannot be spent or used up. It's inexhaustible. He says we have an incorruptible inheritance. We have an undefiled inheritance. It's not tainted. It's pure. It's not like, you know, you ever, have you ever been to, I remember not too long ago going to an auction around here and you go to an auction and you see a number of things and many of those things you think, I would like to have that and I'd really like to have that. But then amidst all of those good things, there are what? Junk. Right? Pieces of furniture where you say, and I, I watched an auctioneer and he said, you know, he started at $10 and nobody had bid anything. And he went down to $5, nobody bid anything. And he said, $1. And nobody would bid anything. So do you know what's going to happen? That's going to be cast into the trash. You know, the wonderful thing about heaven is that our inheritance, that there's nothing when you get there where you're going to say, you know, I don't really enjoy this. This isn't quite what I was thinking what it would be. In heaven, all of our belongings, all of our things are undefiled. They're pure. And then the last one to me, when I begin to understand better the, the meaning of this last part of this verse, it really spoke to me this, uh, this way. It said this, and that fadeth not away. So one way that you would understand this, that I understood this, was this. It, it doesn't. Diminish is an accurate statement, but it doesn't diminish. But furthermore, it doesn't lose its potency. It doesn't fade away in its potency. So think about everything in this world. You buy a brand new car, and the alarm goes off in the driveway, right? <laughs> right? right? It, it, the value of it fades. It's not as new, but it's also not as valued by you. At first, you can't wait to take a ride in it. And then you wake up in the morning, you forgot, oh yeah, I get to drive this to work today. And then day three and day four, then within six months, the potency of the joy is gone. Well, that's my car. And then a year passes and it's completely lost it and you're maybe embarrassed by it because there's a newer one. And your friend has a newer one. But when it says that our inheritance is in heaven and it fadeth not away, it's saying there's no loss of its potency. So think about how far you and I are going to be transformed that when we get to heaven, the moment we get there, the potency of that experience, the joy, is never going to diminish. I'm never going to be there and say, okay, I've seen it all. I'm good now. Man, I really wish I could go back to earth so that I could enjoy the inheritance that God has reserved for all of us is one in which when we're there, I personally believe its potency will increase. And I think that's part, this is my opinion, part of the riches of heaven is that some people, you and I, who try to faithfully serve God and we're rewarded. You say, how, how are we rewarded? If, if a crown doesn't mean anything, if riches don't mean anything, if I don't need to buy anything, if there's not a, a house there, because, you know, that scripture that Jesus talked about, there's, may, I go to prepare a place for you. He's saying that's all it is. It's just a place of a boat. It's not an actual mansion where you're going to dwell in and have kids and have a family. That's not what it's talking about. And so what will be some of the rewards of heaven? Well, here's my take on it. You and I, depending on our works down here, will have a greater capacity to enjoy the pleasures of heaven than other people. We will be able to intake the glory of God at a higher level than other people will. So imagine you're in a place and it is a potent joy and you're overwhelmed by the experience of it. But the person next to you, because of their faithfulness in this life, God has given them a bigger cup in which he can fit more glory and joy and love and peace than what you can experience. Well, that's what it means or not. Here's one thing I do know. The potency of heaven will not diminish. It is not going to be how our minds conceive it because everywhere we've been, it's been this way. I got there. It was great at first. I'm used to it. Everything in this life is that way. Heaven is not. The blessings of heaven 
our inheritance is not this way. Let's continue real quick. Verse 5. So what about these, these riches? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So here's another thing. Not only has God created this place, what good does it do you and I, uh, the recent stock market drop, right? So many of you for decades have put money in the stock market. And then, what was it, January, February, something like that? Maybe June, it just tanked. And so it, it, it's still there in a way, but its value has diminished extensively. And depending on what happens, everything is that way, right? I can own property that's the most beautiful property, but if next door they're putting a plant there, guess what's happened to the value of that property? It's diminished extensively. And everything in this world is subject to a diminishing value. Here's what it says here. When we're faithful in this life to lay up treasures in heaven, God is the keeper of those things. He stores them in heaven for us. They're kept by his power. But then the author here in Peter not only says our goods are kept in heaven, because that word kept in verse 5 says this, who are kept by the power of God, It also tells us, excuse me, um, verse 4, that it's reserved in heaven for you. So our goods are reserved in heaven. But then it also tells us in verse 5, we are kept by him. So the word reserved in verse 4 and the word kept in verse 5 are the same ones. So he's saying this. You've worked in this life. You've laid up an inheritance in heaven. It's kept by the power of God. But lest you fear that you save for retirement and then die at 61 before you can get Social Security, right? Lest you fear that you have done all this and then you can't enjoy it. Know this. Not only is your inheritance saved by God and kept by his power, but so are you. So there is a predestined meaning that is going to take place. And that is this. When you have faithfully tried to lay up treasures in heaven, or just even the treasures that Christ for us has been laid up in heaven, those are reserved there. They're not going anywhere. And because you have been born again, God is keeping your soul, and there's a predestined meeting before, between the inheritance that you have and your saved soul reaching and benefiting from that inheritance. In other words, there is nothing that can be done that I am not going to enjoy the heaven inheritance that is laid up for me. That is not the case with anything down here. We hope, we expect, people change their wills. Markets drop, governments collapse, currencies lose their value. We change where we don't enjoy things we once did. But the inheritance in heaven is there forever. I don't have to worry about it. There's a great security in that. You know what part of the security is? I don't have to plan. I don't have to maneuver within the market. I don't have to to do any of that. It's there. And the only thing I have to do is rejoice in the revealing of it or the potential or the hope of it. And that's what he says in verse 6. He says this, in this, that's what wherein means, in this you greatly rejoice. I want to pause for a moment and say this. There is a balance, and he's going to strike this balance in a moment. If you're a Christian, you should think about heaven. You should think about heaven. Not because you're old, not because you expect to go there in the next six months. I'm saying if you're a young Christian, you should think about heaven. You should learn about heaven. Because he's saying here, these things which God has caused us to be born again unto, a lively hope, an inheritance that is incorruptible, imperishable, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, the fact that you're going to definitely make that meeting place where you inherit it, he says, you need to think on those things and greatly rejoice. Now, there are some people, what's the saying? Uh, Their mind is so filled with heaven, they're of no earthly good. And there can be truth in that. Where somebody is so fixed on dying and the afterlife and heaven that they don't realize, yeah, but God has preserved you here for a reason. That 
dwelling upon heaven is meant to, A, give you a rest and a reprieve from what is down here, but also give you a hope that what is constructed down here truly doesn't matter, and you're going to enjoy something greater if you'll continue to labor in the here and now. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. But then he does what Paul often does. In one sense, he, he lists all these blessings, and he says, Think on these things and rejoice in these things. And then he pivots hard. Really hard. And he says this in verse 6. Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So notice, he says, you need to greatly rejoice. And then he tells us, for a season, often, we're in great heaviness. That word, weightiness. You're weighted down. You're burdened. Now, Paul, I'm going to read a scripture to you very briefly here. Paul says this, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. There is a duality in the Christian life that is worth noting. You hear people say sometimes, if you're a Christian, you ought to be walking around all the time happy. I don't agree with that. Not altogether. That's an incomplete story. Jesus didn't walk around happy all the time. Why? Because in this life, there's a burden that must be bore by us. And that burden does not always end the way that is God's will for it to end. God wills that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But does it happen? Many, perhaps the majority, go off into eternity unprepared to meet God. And so that grieves us, deeply grieves us. Our sorrows down here, and this is what Peter is getting at. It is deeply grieving when you're going through the sorrows down here. When death strikes really close. You can't be, it's fake to be happy. It's fake. If sorrow is within, and yet at the same time, that sorrow is balanced with a great understanding of what God has revealed. He said, you rejoice in knowing what is ahead, even though you sorrow with what is going on around you down here. As a Christian, our mind is often divided into two places it's here as we walk through the path that god has laid out before us trying to obey his word trying to seek forgiveness for sin and the refining fire which he'll get to and i don't have time to this morning where he refines us and we're trying to grow in our maturity and sanctify and that takes a cognizance of things going on down here and yet as we're walking this path down here we pause And we look to heaven and we understand and by this dwelling on what is laid up for us that is eternal, that we will soon join. It gives us more than I can express in the here and now. Think about heaven if you don't and rejoice in it. Here he tells us, I think it's very interesting. Every word in scripture is important. Do you know that? Every single word, every phrase is important. Notice what he says. Wherein you greatly rejoice. You rejoice in the things he mentioned above. And then he says, though now for a season, if need be. That's interesting. If need be or if necessary. Here's what I derive from that little phrase. There are some sorrows, temptations, and trials that are natural to being a human being. When you woke up in the morning and it was really early and you, you stayed up too late last night, you felt really tired and exhausted. And you went through the whole day feeling exhausted and having to fight it. God did not just give you that burden. That's a natural consequence of living in a broken world. So I don't think what he's talking about here are just things that happen, I'm not going to say coincidentally, but routinely within the Christian life. That's not what he's talking about. I think what he's talking about here are trials which God purposely gives to you. Like God says, 
This is a burden and a weight that I'm going to give them in order to refine and change them more into my image. Now that, that's scary ground to walk on. But I want you to realize, regardless of the significance of the pain that you've been through, very often God has placed those things in your life because it's necessary. If needs be. So what do we often do? We often fight them. Don't fight them. Don't fight the trial. Don't avoid. Don't try not to think about. Rather, instead of breaking it down by human psychology and trying to learn all the cause and effects and all those things, pivot to God and say, Lord, you deemed it necessary for me to face this trial. What is it meant to do? Peter tells us here one of the purposes. Very often you hear people say, and this is very true, but this is not the one necessarily that he gets to. The lessons you learn, and that's, that's absolutely true. When we go through a trial, we learn. There's something else that happens, and this is where I'm going to conclude because I don't have time to get onto the remaining verses, and I wish I did this morning. But he says, that the, look at verse 7, that the trial of your faith. That word trial is not, not accurate. That word should be genuineness of your faith. So you and I go through trials to test the genuineness of our faith. So my mind goes to a number of things. Number one, Peter himself. Whenever you're looking for an example about somebody in the scriptures that wrote something, try to go back to their life and see if you can see the example because usually it's, it's glaring. Right? So you remember the night before Jesus' crucifixion? Peter has this faith He'd already proclaimed it in Matthew 16. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we know that he believes in Christ. He believes he is the Messiah. He has faith, but intermixed in his faith are imperfections and blemishes. Overestimations about how much faith that he has. So, you know, whenever you hear somebody say, or I've heard people say before, you know, if I had to, I would die for the faith. or Die for God. I would rather die than recant. And I say, oh, I don't know. I hope I would. But the genuineness of my faith has never been tested in that way. And what I've learned about myself is that it's easy to talk a big game. But then there's something about being in the seat where your faith is being tried, where suddenly all the rational things that you had planned in advance, suddenly you can't grab a hold of them. Because of your frailty and your weakness. And so Peter teaches us this. He says that the genuineness of your faith would be tested like fire. That's what trials do. So how did that happen in Peter's life? We remember Peter was very vocal. And Jesus was telling him, you know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. I'm going to, all these things are going to happen to me. And he said, Lord, I'll go with you into the end. I'm summarizing there. I'll die for you. Well, Jesus says to him, before the night's over, your faith will be tested. So it was. Now, Jesus knew what the end result was going to be, that three times he was going to deny him. And then Peter comes to that moment where Christ is being tried, and he's bloodied and beaten, and he denies him cussing. That's what it says. He was so vehement in his denial of Jesus that he's cursing about it. I do not know that man. And the cock crows... And Jesus looks at him. The Bible says he ran out and he wept bitterly. Why did he go weep bitterly? Because the God-ordained trial exposed that his proclaimed faith was not as genuine as what he thought. I think of, uh, you know, my sons and I, they've gotten real into sports here lately. And so between basketball and football, we're always out, you know, playing basketball or football. And um, oftentimes then our little experience in their minds, they'll compare it to the experience in the pros. And they'll watch a Thursday night game of football, and you know a guy doesn't make a complete pass, and they think, well, that's, I can do that. And you know I can't explain it to them yet, but I'm thinking there's a big difference between in your, being in your backyard with your dad with no pads and no pressure and millions of people not watching you, and 
your physical well-being not being at stake. There's a big difference in that and being in a stadium where 30 million people worldwide are watching you and guys are trying to break you. Big difference. It's easy to talk big on this, but you get on the other stage and your skill level is tested for real. That's why when you're shooting basketball by yourself on a court where nobody's around, you're Michael Jordan. And you get in a game and you can't hit a shot because your skill is tested by the trial, by the competition. And in this sense, he's saying our faith is refined, it's tested. Now, gold and silver, when it is refined, it is burned. Really hot, it's burned. And then the imperfection and blemishes rise and it can be taken out. And that's what he compares it to. So hear me and I'm done. He's saying, rejoice in what the hope that God has given us as Christians. But also draw endurance. Because trials are going to come upon you. God sent, if necessary, God sent trials are going to be sent in your life that are going to stretch you beyond your own capability. And the purpose of those trials is to test, are you really as faithful? Are you really as mature? Are you really as clung to the truth and to God himself as what you think you are, as what you proclaim to be? And in that refining, God, through our failure and through our clinging to him both, it removes that dross, it removes those imperfections. And now our life, our faith is less blemished than what it was. And God is purposely working that in you. That's why Paul's writing, he says this, or excuse me, James, he says, Consider a joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Be happy because God is working on you. He's wanting to make your faith real and genuine. And that's what trials are sent for. This morning, I hope and I pray going through this scripture was an encouragement to me this week. It's helped me to see the hope that I have in Christ. When I write, write down, I wrote down just a few things. And I'm not, I didn't get to the last one here, but I wrote down a few things about our hope. We have a hope because we were born of God and his seed remains in us. We have a hope that is ever living, not temporary as Christians. And the world does not have that. We have an inheritance that is kept by the power of God reserved for us. And there is nothing that can change it lest we fail to reach it, we ourselves are kept by the power of God and predestined now to enjoy that inheritance forever and all of eternity and that hope. Finally, the last one we got to this morning is the trials of our faith can be heavy, but we can take encouragement and consolation knowing that they are creating Paul. Paul says it this way, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh a more eternal weight of glory in us. He says this about the life. Everything you go through down here. Now, coming from Paul, that's saying something. He experienced a lot more hardship than you and I ever did. And he called it a light affliction. And at the end of the verse, he uses the opposite of the word light. And he says, we have a more eternal weight, that word means heaviness, of glory to be revealed in us. So he's trying to show us this. What we experience down here, as hard as it seems, is small in comparison to the extraordinary which is waiting for us. I didn't get to the rest of verse 7. But he tells us this also, that that genuine faith will lead to our glorification. There's a lot in that, but did you know that one day 
those of us that remain faithful in our service to God, and it's uncomfortable for me to even talk about, will be glorified with him. Will reign with him. Will judge the nations with him. In other words, God, because of what Christ has done, has prepared a hope that you and I will even be lifted up in heaven for remaining genuine in our tried faith. It's a doctrine called the glorification of the saints. It's taught throughout the New Testament. I'm thankful this morning that we have hope. I hope you find encouragement. I hope as a side note, those of you that study, struggle to study the scriptures, by breaking those verses down, it may have helped you to some extent. Someone have something on their heart this morning. That's our message today. I hope you find hope in that, encouragement in those truths. I hope you'll go back this week and read through those things and uncover a lot of things that I neglected to bring to you this morning.